Okay, so I made these charts for all of you. So we're going to take a look at those to start with. So the source for this is Dorothy Sayers. You probably heard of her book. She's an author of The Lost Tools of Learning. So um, this is the source of this chart, and it's really helpful because she gives a breakdown of just childhood development in education. Okay, so I thought it would be good to start off with the first column. You can see there that's the beginning grammar, the pre-polys. K2, or sorry, <laughs> kindergarten through second grade. So those are the pre-polys. So this is your age group right here. Um, it also does include four, five. And then, of course, in my classes, you get to six, seven, and eight. So I thought it would just be good to go over this because this is your audience. This is who are you, you're teaching, and you need to know your audience before you're teaching them. So let's read some of the student characteristics. Okay, number one, obviously excited about learning. Okay, and that's true. Some of you have been in here already. Whenever it's a new face, they're super excited. Um, they pretty much love everything about school. Very enjoyable. Number two, enjoys games, stories, songs, and projects. Okay. Number three, short attention span. Okay. If you have any of the, this age in your ministries, then you know if that practical story is going on and on and on, they're not with you anymore. Uh, number four, wants to touch, taste, feel, smell, and see. Number five, imaginative, creative. And number six, likes to copy and imitate. Okay, number six is really important, and we're going to touch on that a little bit as we go over to talk about borrowing. All right, and then just some of the teaching methods to look at. Number one, guide discovering. Okay, so they like to discover. Number two, explore and find things. Number three, they use lots of tactile items to illustrate the point. Does anyone know what that means, tactile items? So you're talking about manipulatives. Yes, things that they want to touch, okay? So they're using their sense of touch. That's why we have manipulatives in this lesson, and you'll use them throughout so many of your other lessons with this age group. Okay, number four, they like to sing, play games, chant, recite, color, draw, paint, and build. So the chant and recite is very important too, and that will come into play when we talk about borrowing as well. Number five, use body movements. Okay, so Tamar knows this because she's the Bible teacher in this class. But she'll be telling the story and they're sitting and she can tell, all right, they're not with me anymore. So she has them stand up and she has them act out the story. She has them sing a song with motions. And you've seen that even in ministries. You sing a song, if you go up to lead children and you're singing like this, well, they're probably not really getting much out of it. They're not enjoying it. So we make a lot of motions. That's why at this age, this is what's important to them. <laughs> and this is how they learn. Okay, so then number six, short creative projects. Emphasis on short. <laughs> number seven, show and tell. Drama, hear, read, and tell stories. Number eight, field trips. Number nine, reinforcing conceptual understanding of letters, numbers, associated meanings. And number 10, provide them opportunities to copy and imitate. Okay, so think parrot, pre-poly, what do parrots do? They're not speaking from their own mind, right? They're just imitating. And so that is children at this age. They will imitate so many things that you do. And you can use that to your advantage and help in your teaching. Okay, so we're going to start off with some of this workshop type stuff. So this is borrowing from scratch. How many of you have seen this used before, like the ones and the tens with the straws? Okay, so some of you have. All right, so this is a concept that will come up uh, for second graders after they've learned how to carry. So, you know, think you're adding, they're carrying to several different place values to the thousands place. Well, then all of a sudden this shows up. So it's super important for you to remember that they have nothing else to tie this to. I mean, there's no previous knowledge that they can say, oh, this will help me understand carrying, okay, or sorry, borrowing. So it's a really important to remember that. So that's what Mrs. Wright is talking about when she's saying teaching from scratch, okay? Um, so some of the preparation that you'll need, you can see some of the things I have out, but I have the jars, the ones in the tens place, um, just to make a little remark on this, it's really important that you use the idea of the bundles, okay? I saw something on Pinterest that was interesting. They were showing a number on the board. So let's say it was, you know, 59. And so for the five, they had five straws, or they were like sticks or something, five sticks. And then for the nine, they had nine. But how is that incorrect? So the number is 59, and they have five sticks in the tens place. It should be... 
five groups of 10 things, right, to show 50. So you might see that as an idea and it seems really cute and it seems really easy, but it's really important that you're using bundles because this is groups of 10. We're talking about the tens place, okay? So we have our straws, which I would suggest prepping them beforehand so you're not sitting there, you know, trying to count out uh, kind of the straws and bundle them all together. So you have your jars, your, jars, your straws, and then manipulatives. Um, these will come into play in the lesson. It's very important to have a different variety of them. I would probably say three would be fine. Okay, and then you can, of course, see that I have the writing on the board. Um, we'll talk about this in a minute. But I have the problems written up and notice that I've put them in different colors. Okay, so you're going to have to overemphasize the order of the numbers on the board. And I'll tell you why in a little bit, okay? And then I also have this sub subtraction poem for them. So I read it for them. Whenever there's a, something, a visual that's new or a new poem or something I'm teaching them, I'll read it. So more on the top, no need to stop. More on the floor, this is it. Go next door and get 10 more. Okay, so you need to remember that whenever you're teaching something new, Children at this age group are pre-polys, so it is helpful for you to have some type of poem or a song or a chant. You know, give them something that they can say over and over. So Desiree would remember from her recitation time, she had them do that uh, 30 days past September. I could not count for you how many times I said that in second grade. We say it over and over, and I think they start learning it in first grade. But we say it over and over, and that's because of this age group. This is how they learn. So whenever you're introducing something new, not that you have to be a poet, but I mean, there's lots of resources out there. You can look something up. Um, but I found the subtraction poem, and I taught it to them right away, and then I use it. Now, really, whenever I'm borrowing, whenever we're doing a problem in class where there's borrowing, they say it now. Go next door and get 10 more. Okay, so really, it's to your advantage to teach them something like that. And then I have had students come you know, back to me years later and say, oh, I remember the 50 states because, you know, we sang that song in second grade. Or um, I have a poem that I do whenever it's helping verbs. Helping verbs, helping verbs, there are 23. So as much as possible, try to introduce a chant, a song, or something that you can use along with the teaching, okay? All right, so um, I would start, if this were my lesson, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit how I would talk to my students, but I'm also talking to you. So um, I would always start off with something to pull their interest into the lesson, okay? Because sometimes when you have something new, there are, you'll have some students that will think, I'm, I'm not going to be able to understand this. You know, maybe some of your more melancholy ones. So you want to start off with something that's going to grab their attention. So I'll usually say, class, today we are learning something we have never learned before. And right then and there, you have probably over half of your students, you know, rubbing their fingers like this because they're so excited, right? And then the ones that aren't doing that, at least you have their attention, okay? So you want to do something that will just, okay, I have everyone involved now. So I'll start off with that. Um, so then we're going to shift over here a little bit. So I'll start off and I'll tell them um, that and then we'll look at a number on the board and I won't have it written up already. I'll write it in the process of doing the lesson, but this is just your starter, okay? So the idea of the number uh, looking at 34 is I'm saying just because I've moved something from the tens place to the ones place, I'm still dealing with the same number. So I would have the jars in front of them like this and I would say, okay class, I want someone to tell me what number do I have represented with the straws up here. So I'll have someone come up. Now they might say, you know, one, two, you might have to remind them, oh, but what place value is this? This is the tens place. We're counting by ten. So then 10, 20, 30, and then they'll count this 31, 32, 33, 34. That's right. I have 34 straws. So that is the number, 34. Okay, so then I'll ask them what would happen if I took a bundle from the tens place, this is 10, right? And I move it over to the ones place and I would take it out and I would put it in here. So then I'm questioning them, do I still have the same number? Look, I just borrowed a bundle from the tens place and I put it in the ones, do I still have the same number? So I'd have them, another student come up and count. Okay, 10, 20, and then individually 21 all the way to 14, okay? So then they're getting, then I would write on the board this problem and they're getting the idea 20 plus 14. What is the equal? 34. 
right? It's still the same number. So you're teaching them, you haven't maybe said borrowed yet, but you're teaching them that. Just because I've moved something from this place to this place, I still really am working with the same number. I have the same number, okay? All right, so then I would get going with the actual borrowing. So I would introduce my poem first. Oh, actually, I'm just gonna bundle these back up. No, I'm not. <laughs> I would introduce my poem first um, and say it to them, okay? So I would point out, um, with this math problem. Okay, class, let's look at this problem right here. What does it say? 58 minus 5. Okay. okay, excuse me. So let's look in the ones place. We have an 8. Can I take 5 away from 8? And what would they say? Yes, I can. Okay, so we know the answer is 3. So this is more on the top, no need to stop. So if I have an 8 on the top and I have a smaller number below, then I can do the subtraction problem. Okay, well then I'm pointing out this problem here. More on the floor, uh-oh, look. Now I have eight at the bottom, and I have five at the top. If I have five things, can I take away eight things? So that's where your manipulatives come into play. So normally I have their desks right in front of me, and I would set it out on their desks, okay? But um, uh, let's look at the problem that we have on the board, and I would just start with one. So we have 31 minus 14. So, okay, Desiree, I have one thing right here in my hand. Can you come and take away four things from it? Okay, so the important thing to remember here is that they will, in their mind, flip it to make this problem possible. Okay, so automatically they will be telling you the answer is three. They always, always do that. They're working it out in a way that they can do it because they don't know how to borrow yet. Okay, so you have to overemphasize. No, 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 wait a minute. This doesn't say four minus one. This says one minus four. Okay, so then I would use something else. All right, look, I have one orange in my hand. Okay, Tamar, I have one. Can you come up and take away four? Now, I have had students come up to me like, yeah, you know, and then they come to reach like this, and then, oh, wait a minute, I can't. Now, your sharp ones will pick it up right away. But you'll have some that think, oh yeah, that's absolutely possible, until they realize, oh wait, that doesn't say four minus one, it's one minus four. Um, another thing I'll use, I'm kind of using them all now with this problem, but I'll use pencil, something familiar to them. Okay, Kelly, I have one pencil in my hand, come and take away four. Now, at this point, when you've done it three times, they start laughing, they know, it's impossible. Okay, we can't do that. So, um, then I'll show it to them with the straws. I have 31, okay? So I have 31 straws, can I take away 14? Now we know that we can take 14 away from the number 31. But if we look in the ones place, then all of a sudden we know we have a problem. It says one minus four. So what do I do? Then I'm using the poem again. I'm gonna go next door and get 10 more, okay? So that means I'm taking a bundle out, and that means I'm crossing out this number three, and I'm making it say two instead, and I'll remind them, class, that's not just two though, that's how many? It's 10, 20, okay? And then, what do I do with that group of 10 that I just borrowed? And I'm just laughing because I'm thinking right now of their faces when I taught it this year. I mean, really, they're like 10, and I'm taking it and I'm moving it somewhere. They had no clue what to do with the 10. And then I, I was looking in their seat work pages, you know, when we first started this out. And I mean, this number was turning into 11, it was turning into two. I, it was really, really funny because you can tell they're just trying to get a hang of it. So the 10, but you're showing them visually, right? The 10 is going now into the ones place. So can I add 10 plus one? Yes, I can. Class, what is 10 plus one? They'll tell me 11. So I'm gonna cross out this one, and I'm gonna write 11. Now, some of you with borrowing probably have just written the number by the side. Have you guys done it like that before? So that's fine to do later on, but when I'm first teaching it, I will cross out the entire number, and then I'll write the 11. Does that make sense? Well, then later on, you get to say, class, this is the way we learned it, but I have an even easier way for you to do it. Watch this. Instead of taking the time to cross out this whole number, Look, I'm just gonna write, <gasps> see, what does it say? 11, and they get so excited, they think that's the best thing, okay? So then I say, okay, yes, now we can do the math problem. Class, what is 11 minus four? Come on, class, what's 11 minus four? Seven. Oh, my second graders are better at this. Okay, and then what's two minus one? one. Okay, good job. See, now we can do the problem. We could do the problem because we borrowed from the tens place. That's what I'll tell them. All right, now let's get ready for 62. So I try to prep here. 62, one, two, three, 
four, <coughs> five, six. All right. I know this seems like a lot, but it's really worth it. It's going to pay off at the end when they're doing their math problems on their seat work pages and they're getting them right. And you as a teacher, yes, it worked. Okay. So then, let me put these away real quick. 62 minus 46. Okay, so right away, what are they going to say for the ones place? They're going to say the answer is 4, right? They're going to switch it in their minds. So then I'll get out two things again. Okay, look. Here are two bears. There they are. Okay, now so-and-so, come and take away 6 from that. Can you do it? No. It's impossible, isn't it? All right, then I'll walk up to another student. It sounds really redundant, doesn't it, at this point? It's like, wow, really, you do all that? But really, we do. <laughs> all right, I have two pencils, Tamar. Come and take away six. Can you do it? No, you can't. That means it's impossible, right? OK, so what are we supposed to do so we're able to do that subtraction problem? We're going to go next door and get 10 more. You're saying it again and again, and you're calling on them to say it. That's how it goes. OK, so then we'll say, all right, well, if I'm supposed to go next door and get 10 more, then what do I do? I'm going to cross out this 6 right now. And class, what would it turn into? I'm going to take a bundle of 10 out of my 10s jar. OK, so how many do I have left? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So that means this 6 is getting crossed out. I'm going to write a 5 there. OK, and then I would just emphasize again, it's not really the number 5. It's 50, OK? Then I'm going to take this. I'm going to take my 10 and put it in my ones jar. And again, I would have someone else come up and count individually. How many straws do we have here? OK, so what does it mean if I take 10, I add it to 2? What's my new number? It'll be 12, right? OK, so we're writing our 12. Class, now we can subtract, right? Because if we have 12 things, we can take away 6. If we have 5 things, we can take away 4, right? So what is 12 minus 6, class? 6. Good. And what is 5 minus 4? One. Very good. Class, look at that. You just did, that's way too long. You just did two problems with borrowing. Okay? So does that make sense? You guys have any questions about it? Are we good? Everyone understands it? Okay. So it really does seem like you do the same thing over and over, but you do. Okay? They need that repetitiveness okay that need which we might see as redundancy but in order to help them learn it and learn it well you have to do that okay so um, you might think do you do that every time okay so probably the next day when I have another borrowing problem up on the board I'll do the same thing again and then the next day um, you can really as a teacher start picking up when they're getting it and when you're not having to do so much uh, so I would say something like this. I have several students that are really sharp. You guys have been in here, Archie and Edmund and Bethany, you know, ones like that. I would do it one time and they would pick it up, okay? Then you have your average students. You can tell they still need the help. And then you have your slower students. You have to do it again and again. And really, too, um, if you're seeing your slower students are struggling in their seat work pages, that's when you just take the jars to the back of your desk and do it one-on-one -on -one with them. Let them do it. Let them move the straws, let them count it, and pretty soon it will start made, making sense to them. Okay? All right, so manipulatives, jars, straws, have your, uh, your problems written on the board and a really fun <coughs> chant or poem for them to go over. All right. Okay, so now we're going to go from that to our notes, a little bit of a a lecture, and this is um, four expectations of a student teacher. Okay, so four expectations of a student teacher. I would say these are um, the very basics. This is just your starting point. Okay, um, and I really want you to know my heart on this. Uh, my first year of homeroom teaching. I was already given a student teacher and I've been working with girls ever since, okay? So this is not, you know, my way of getting on my soapbox and, or, or picking on anybody. But, you know, once you work with people for a certain amount of time, you just start to notice, okay, this is kind of a pattern I'm seeing again and again. But if these girls can get a hold of it, then their student teaching time can be very special. And then, you know, their career later on when they're impacting children, working with children. So I just wanted you to know that from my perspective. Um, and you know what? The truth is everyone that's teaching in the academy now was sitting right where you're sitting. 
you know, once upon a time. So, all right, so the first expectation, major expectation we would have of a student teacher is that you're someone who's able to communicate. Okay, someone who is able to communicate. I heard someone say once, if you were never taught to communicate well, you have to make yourself learn how to do it and do it well. As a teacher, I mean, think about it. You're communicating all day, every day. So who are some people you're communicating with? Who would it be? Just call it out. Students. Yes, your students all day long. And it gets very exhausting. But really, as a teacher, you don't have the me time. Like, OK, it's time for me to sit and be at my desk and for no one to bother me. No, you're talking with them, communicating with them all day long. OK, who else? Yes, coworkers, right? Um, and in a lot of different senses too. You're working together to uh, build your professionalism. If you have a branch off teacher, then you're talking about discipline issues that have come up throughout the day. And then Brooks, are you said? Administration. Yes, absolutely. Um, so many things have to be run through your boss before you can make a decision on it. Um, another one would be parents. You're working with and communicating with parents. Um, and that starts early in the morning and it goes through the rest of the day too. So you're communicating with a lot of people. Your advisory teacher, right? No one said that advisory teacher, that's someone that you are communicating with. Coworkers, boss, parents. So girls, the idea is to start now and push yourself beyond the point of just feeling comfortable, okay? Um, you wanna make a habit of talking face to face with people. And, and rather than using a device. Now you will have some teachers say, I prefer that you email me. You know, I'm not saying if you use a device you don't have good communication skills. But I think what happens is we tend to overuse it. We get comfortable with it, we overuse it, and then you really do sacrifice good communication skills. Okay? So make sure you're talking, pushing yourself to talk to people face to face. Um, and then just from you know, the years of working with people, I have a, f a few good communication is not, okay? So good communication is not putting off talking to someone until you have to do it. And I'm talking about lining up your observations. I'm talking about seeing a teacher to schedule a practicum. Um, I'm talking about seeing a teacher because you're going to be in their classroom pretty soon teaching a lesson. Just remember that how you are communicating right now with people, other teachers in the academy, people who are your authority, you're building your habits right now, and that's going to determine how you're gonna communicate with your advisory teacher in the future, okay? Um, good communication is not waiting for your advisory teacher to seek you out. So imagine you're a student teacher and something has happened and you need to let the teacher know about it. You should, I'll say, you should let the teacher know about it. Don't wait for her to hear about something and then, oh, you know what, I need to talk to her about that. No, you seek her out first. Um, you've made a mistake, we all do, and it will happen when you're student teaching. So rather than waiting for your advisory teacher to find out about it, go to her right away. You be the first one, seek her out and say, okay, this happened, what should I do? Um, good communication is not assuming you know what the teacher wants rather than taking the time to ask her what she wants. So this could be applied in so many areas, but we think of the areas of discipline, questions that you might have about the curriculum. Um, I, ha I have a little bit of an example I could use here. Um, in the curriculum for history, there are some things where it's questionable, and not questionable evil, but just I wouldn't necessarily want it said in my classroom. And so I told the student teacher, you know, you might find some things that come up. If anything is questionable to you, make sure you ask me about it before you teach. So I kind of pointed out a few things. Well, a lesson came up and she read it and didn't ask me about it and then ended up telling my whole class something that I completely disagreed with from the curriculum, okay? So then what do I have to do as the teacher? Then I have to be able to reteach that right and then I'm in a sense I'm correcting her mistake so if there's a question about something or you know whatever like that comes up don't assume oh you know what she'll be fine if I say this or she'll be fine if I try this see her about it first and then go forward 
Okay, um, and then we're at good communication is not still. Good communication is not contacting someone late in the evening. Okay, so normal etiquette, etiquette dictates what time? Anyone know? Yes, before nine. Okay, so it's, it's a little bit unsafe for you to assume that someone's going to be at their phone or at their computer at 1045, 11 o'clock at night. Okay, so if you find yourself, oh man, I have to shoot up that email, then that's something you, <coughs> excuse me, should have thought about earlier in the day. Okay, and, and like I said, especially if it's a time sensitive thing, you're thinking they're going to be right there getting your email or right there, you know, I don't know that you text message teachers, but anything after 9 p.m. is just really bad etiquette. Okay, think about it earlier and take care of it. Okay, so the first expectation is that you're a person who is able to communicate the next one. You are a person who is prepared. And this is, I'm talking more, what you're doing in the classroom. So first you want to get to setting your lessons as soon as possible. As soon as possible. That I'm just going to wing it with this lesson is never a good philosophy for a teacher to have. I know personally I have been in situations where it's a time crunch and maybe I just thought, okay, I'm going to look over this. Every time it's been that scenario, I promise you something has come up where I thought, oh, wait a minute, I'm not prepared to say this or I'm not prepared to talk about it. So get to studying your lessons early on, okay? Um, the more you know on the subject, then the more knowledge you're going to have to speak from. So in this sense, preparing could be meeting with the teacher to go over the lesson and asking them, how do you teach this? What words would you say? Um, how could I explain this? Another way to prepare would be extra reading on the topic, just to broaden your base of knowledge. There are so many things that I never say to my second graders because I know the level is too high for them, but I am mentally preparing myself to teach it by reading the information. So it's not reading it with the motive of, okay, I'm going to present them with a college level explanation of whatever. No, but if I can understand it, then I'm teaching them from a broader base and they're going to benefit from that. Also talking with someone who has specialized in that field. Um, I could use the example of talking with Mrs. Jennifer Wright. She's let me borrow a lot of things for science class before, but also um, I'm going to teach a lesson, I look at it and I say, you know what, I should catch Mrs. Wright about this. And then I'll ask her, what is the most accurate way, scientifically, what is the most accurate way I could explain this? Now, of course, the level that she would explain it and the level I'm going to use in first and second grade, it's, it's much simplified. Um, but I want, I want it to be accurate and I'm preparing them for the future. So I'm not going to say something here because it's really cute. I want it to be accurate and then they're being prepared for what they'll learn later on. So ask people, talk to people. Okay, um, another expectation um, is, nope, sorry, this is still part of a person who's prepared. Don't overlook the simple things. This is very, very important. It's probably the thing I see the most often with student teachers or someone that's coming in to teach a lesson. You need to think about things like the phrases or words you will use in the lesson. So many times a girl will come in to do something to teach and her vocabulary level is so much higher than what a first or second grader is going to understand. Okay, you want to be very specific about that. Now, does that mean I never challenge my class with new words? No. But when I do that, if I'm introducing a new word to them, there's two things I must do. So important. You have to show it to them visually which is going to be writing it on the chalkboard, writing it on a visual, and then you have to give them a simple definition. Okay, so I would say you have a lesson and it's about something they haven't learned before and there's this word. And there's really no way of getting out of using this word. We'll use the word, but then tell them what it means, show them how it's spelled, have them say spell say it. Okay, so you can, you can challenge them, but you have to define it and you have to show it to them. Okay, and then not overlooking the simple things, what items you will need in the front of the classroom. Okay, my thought is if you have to go to the back of the room in the middle of a lesson to get something, you're not prepared. So that means thinking through a lot. And for you, if that means making a checklist of, okay, when I teach this, I'm going to have this, this, 
this, this with me. Then do it so that you're not caught unprepared for the class, okay? Um, something else simple that we might tend to overlook is problems on their seat work pages. Don't let this take you by surprise. Okay, I have a funny story, but I taught for Mrs. Brader when I was probably a sophomore or a junior in college. And I, I mean, I prepared for that lesson, I met with her, but one thing I didn't do was look over the seat work page. And I really thought in my mind, it's a kindergarten seat work page, like how hard could it be? That was my thought. So then I have the paper, you know, and I'm in front of the class. I've, I've got everything under control, okay? So I'm looking at this paper and it says, find a rhyming word for this picture. And all of a sudden it hit me. Wait, is that a boat or is it a ship? I, you know what I'm saying? Something small like that, I didn't, I wasn't prepared because I overlooked that simple thing. Seat work pages, okay? So if you're going in to teach a lesson for someone or you know, you're the student teacher, be looking over their seat work pages. It happens so often comes up, I haven't looked at the page yet, you know, student teacher, I haven't looked at the page yet. Oh my, what do we do here? And you're supposed to read something from the curriculum and you don't, you're not at the right page or what have you. Okay, so be prepared with those seat work pages. Okay, and this is just an overall preparation thing. A personal rule that I have is if I haven't read over something five times, I'm not prepared to present it to anyone else. Okay, so think about it as a teacher, um, even as a student teacher, you have PTF presentations. You have open house presentations where parents, grandparents, people from the community come in and watch you teach. Okay, so I read it over five times and at that point I feel like I have a mental outline already in my mind and then I'm ready to present it to someone else. So read it and read it and read it and practice it, practice your delivery. That will all be a huge help. Okay, so another expectation of a student teacher this is three, you must take the initiative. You must take the initiative. Okay, so with every lesson that you teach, do something to make it yours. Okay, you can just follow the curriculum and you can just do what is on the curriculum, but that's just doing the bare minimum. And I tell my student teachers, if you just do what's required of you, that's average, right? That's C, it's just average. So do something to make it yours. Do something to make your lesson pop. Um, and with all the resources that we have available to us, the internet, library, some of you are super artistic, right? Um, there's no reason really to teach an elementary class without using some sort of visual, right? From our chart, what did we read? They're visual learners. So with everything out there available to us, we can use the visual. We can improve the lesson that way. I don't know if any of you have heard of this resource. It's called Teachers Pay Teachers. I don't know how many of you have heard of that. Girls, that place is excellent. It's a, just a website. You basically are paying for the license to print something. Just the other day, I bought 96 pages worth of different visuals for math for $2. I mean, it is excellent. Okay, so you're paying a little bit more because it's your cardstock and it's your laminate, whatever. So you're just buying the PDF format and then you're printing it, you're cutting it out, you're laminating it. So in a sense, you know, that takes work. But it's an excellent resource. And I don't know how much of your, how many of your visuals have to be made all homemade? Is that still a, okay, so mostly you're making things now and it has to be you doing it. But as a teacher, when, you're, when you have your own class, that's probably not going to necessarily be the rule. So you can use resources like that and they're super, super, super helpful. Um, and then the other thing I love about Teachers Pay Teachers is that it's not just, I mean, they have all the main academic subjects, but then they also have class decor, which is great. So let's say I'm gonna do a ladybug theme. They have in one packet that you would buy from there, everything for a ladybug visual, or a bulletin board, sorry, everything you'd wanna put up on your chalkboard, name tags for every one of their seats, all types of things you can hang from the ceiling. I mean, they're super, super great. So I would really use that. You can just, you know, cre create an account and then use it. Um, then remember for um, taking the initiative in your lesson, remember that the more you invest in something, whether it's time, effort, money, or your creativity, the more it will mean to you personally. And then another one, um, taking the initiative. Work, work alongside your advisory teacher to plan visuals, games, 
etc. that will add excitement to your lesson. So work alongside her and ask, what can I do that will really help them grasp this concept? And then ask all the questions you can think of. <coughs> I know that a lot of the student teachers um, journal during their student teaching time. And that's when you use that notebook, carry it with you, and that's when an um, you know, unexpected question pops up. I really need to ask her that. I really, I thought about this and I want to catch her about that. Write it down so then you can go over it during your meeting times or during class time. Um, okay, so Tamar knows this because she meets with me, but for years I've been meeting with girls and at the end of the meeting I always say the same thing. Do you have any questions? And it's not just necessarily do you have any questions about what I just said, but it's do you have any questions? Was there something that I did? You say, why did you do it that way? Was there something that I said? Why did you say it that way? Was there a discipline issue? Why did you, you know, deal with that situation this way? Ask questions. Now, at first, you're probably not really going to know what to ask because you're just there and you're observing. And I mean, some of you have gone through the academy, but um, you're there and you're observing and it's, it's new and you're taking it all in. But then once you're getting into the flow of things and once it's, you know, in the middle of the school year, you want to be able to ask questions and you should have questions. Um, you want to come in to that teacher's environment, to their classroom, and you want to soak every little bit in. I remember with my student teaching, um, I was probably a great annoyance to my advisory teacher, but I asked questions nonstop, and whatever I could get involved in, I did. For PTF, I wanted to be in that classroom. I wanted to see her interacting with the parents, and when they questioned her, I wanted to see how she would respond. I wanted to see how she would present something. So I really, I have the belief that if you just come in during your student teaching time, you teach your class and then you're gone and you're not ever really in the classroom for the rest of the time, I don't know how you're getting a really well-rounded perspective of the classroom. So I would really strongly suggest, you know, some of you are going to be working or taking other classes during your student teaching. So try to pick a day. Look through your week, talk to your advisory teacher, try to pick a day where you can at least be in the classroom for the entire time. Because I promise you, in the, in the three weeks that you observe before you start teaching, you're not going to see every scenario that comes up in a classroom. So try to pick a time, get in there, be in there as much as possible, and help your advisory teacher as much as possible. Okay, so this is the last of the expectations of a student teacher. Um, you must show leadership qualities in the classroom. You must show leadership qualities in the classroom. I read this quote about leadership and I thought, wow, this perfectly, perfectly applies in the elementary classroom. It says, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. And that's very true when you're talking about elementary students. So first, uh, a way that you're going to um, well, wait, I'm going to skip that one for a second. Um, children can pick up just in seconds the message that you're giving them from your facial expressions, from your body language, and from your words. They are so good at picking up on phony things. <laughs> they can tell when you're being real or not. But also they can tell if you're coming in insecure, nervous, which, you know, it's perfectly normal to be nervous, but you don't want to show too much of that. You want to present yourself confidently to the students. Always want to present yourself confidently. So if you're acting insecure or you're failing to take charge of the class, you're going to have insecure students and you're going to have students who will run over you. And I really do mean that. I know this is just, we're talking about six, seven, and eight year olds, but um, if you're not setting the tone, they will do just that. And then just to point off of this, a lot of girls, I'll hear them say, oh, I want to teach first and second grade. You know, they're so cute, and um, they just have such great personalities, and they're so small. And I, I think their thinking is that because they're so young, there's not going to be a lot of discipline issues. But really, that's not the case. <laughs> they're sinners just like everybody else. Um, they know how to sneak and lie and steal and manipulate and gossip. They're just maybe not as good at hiding it as middle, you know, middle school or high schoolers are because they are pretty. You, know, you can see a lot of what's going on by what they show on their face. They're not so clever to hide this part. Um, most aren't anyways. You, you always have those few. You have those few. But 
you want to present yourself confidently, take charge in classroom situations. So I thought, well, what are a few practical ways that you can be the leader in the classroom? A few practical ways that you can show that you are the leader in the classroom. One is to have a walk with the Lord. That's the most important one because we really can't reflect His love and point to Him as the ultimate leader if we're not praying and gleaning from the Bible every day. So the thing is, you know, you come in and you do the same thing every single day and the well runs dry very quick. So if you're not walking with the Lord, you have nothing to offer them. So that would be the first one. The second one, show by your example how to treat others and how to speak to others. You're showing by your example how to treat others and how to speak to others, even when you're frustrated, even when you're, that student has just done that again and they already did it five times. They need to be disciplined, but the way that you treat them is speaking volumes to the rest of your class. Um, number, uh, the second part of that is using manners. Use manners in the classroom. And this goes back to children at this age are imitators. They will do what you do, whether what you're doing is right or wrong in some, sen some senses. They'll imitate you. So you need to make sure you're using manners. I try at least once a year, and it's not because I'm you know, trying to be prissy, but I try once a year to read a book on etiquette just as a refresher course. Because as a teacher, they're watching me and I need to make sure I'm setting the right example. Okay, another way to be a leader in the classroom, take charge when there are behavioral issues. Mostly here I'm talking about games or free time in the classroom. Um, address the situation immediately when you can tell things are getting out of hand. You have to call out those students and just deal with it right away. Now, as a good teacher, you are going to have things in place so that things aren't always getting out of hand. That shouldn't happen frequently, but it does happen. And when the responsibility is on the student, it's on their behavior, then it's your job to deal with it, okay, and call them out. Okay, I'm going to up here. All right, and then the next one is giving constant verbal guidance in the classroom. You need to give constant verbal guidance in the classroom. So when it's your classroom, of course, you're setting up routines that you expect them to follow for the rest of the year. Now, Mrs. Wright, when you all came in last time, made a point, you know, well, this class is already trained, but when it's your class and it's August, that's going to be a different story. So the only way they will know what to do is by you walking it through it, through, sorry, walking through it with them step by step. <coughs> that's the only way. Um, just to give you an idea, the first one, two, three weeks of school, I have three pages of nothing but routines that I'm teaching them. So that means the minute they walk into my classroom in the morning, what do they do with their backpacks? What do they do with their jackets? Okay, then what do they do at their desk? How do they write on their assignment pad? What are they supposed to leave out to pass in to the teacher? Then what are they supposed to start working on? Then at playtime, what are they allowed to do? What are they not allowed to do? If you think about it, there are so many things throughout the day. I can take it for granted now because I've already taught this class and they, they're, you know, they pretty much do what I've said. But when you're first starting out, there is so much to teach them. So you're giving constant verbal guidance in that area. And then also with activities, games, seat work pages, you need to give them firm verbal guidance before, during, and after. Okay, um, the one, those of you that have taught for my math class, you know, you have to go over the entire seat work page with them. You have to read through all of the directions. <clears throat> okay, so another thing that you want to do to show that you know, you're taking leadership in the classroom is involve yourself in games and activities with the class. I have had girls come in to teach and you know they have this super fun game and they have this idea and they wanted to do it so I said great go for it and so then they come in and they have the game in the classroom and okay this is how we play the game they tell the students this is how we play the game and then okay so and so come play and I'm as a teacher I'm sitting in the back like this is so anticlimactic come on it's not fun so when you're doing it with the class, you want to be involved. Not just the person up there saying do this or do that or explaining it, 
but it's not the same thing. You want to be involved. Play the games with them. Um, praise them when they're doing well. This is in the middle of the game. Praise them when they're doing well. Give advice as to what they could do next time that would be better. Okay, so I'll use tic-tac-toe as a really simple example because we, we can all relate to that, right? But, you know, we're playing tic-tac-toe and it's boys against the girls and the girls have two X's right in a row and it's the boys' turn to come up. And, you know, I, I tell them, don't, don't give hints, don't tell them where to put it. So then he takes his chalk and he looks and then he puts the O way over here. Okay, so then that's the time for me to say, oh, okay, so-and-so, you put your O here, but what could you have done to block the girls? I know that sounds really simple, but in first and second grade, you do tell them things like that. So you're teaching them, okay, this time or next time, you should do this, and then you could have won. See? All right, so we're learning. Another thing, we have um, our second graders doing the 50 states. We have their times here. It's a big deal right now. Julie is at 21 seconds saying all 50 states. But Bethany's close. And Bethany is super competitive. And she's been practicing and practicing. And she'll go up to say it. And I'm timing her. And she'll say, Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Col California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Florida. And so what am I noticing? She's repeating those states. So I say to her, Bethany, Look, your time is, you're doing great. Your time is really low, but you keep repeating the states. Every time you repeat them, you're adding one or two seconds onto your time. So I'm seeing it and I'm giving her advice as to how she can improve. That's your job as the teacher. Then also cheer them on in the game. Cheer them on. You're not just a spectator. You're an active participant. Cheer them on and make it fun. Dive into whatever your class is doing. You know, little children need to have times during the day that they can just be silly. And I'm not saying an uncontrolled silly, but think about it. They come to school right away, you know. Let's start on our assignment pads, everyone. Then right away we go into Bible class, and then right away they get all their stuff and they march down to break off. Okay, so we expect a lot of them. They need to have some times during the day where they can just be silly with you. Okay, and then you're kind of showing your heart as a teacher. You're saying, I like to be spending time with my class. I like when we're all laughing together. You're showing them that you care about them. Okay, remember, a leader is one who go, knows the way, goes the way. Do it with them and shows the way. Okay, that's all I have for the lesson. Time for bulletin boards. All right, so let me give you a few notes first about the bulletin board material I'm going to put up on my big, huge 12 by 4. Um, okay, so the thing used to be that girls always wanted to iron their material before they put it up on bulletin boards. And then it's like, no way. Okay, so is that not a thing anymore? Okay, so that was... That's Some still do. Some still do. And you're like, those are the OCD ones. Um, okay, so that was the big... What was that from? Were you saying something too? I spray mine with water. Spray it with water. Yep, okay. <laughs> so that used to be the big thing, though. Is okay, I'm going to bring my material to the rec room, I'm going to iron it all out and so my board can look nice, whatever. So I started doing uh, my material the way I'm going to show you about, I don't know, four or five years ago. I will say, and you know, girls, you know, prepping for the, for the bulletin board is a blast. Seeing the end result is a blast, but this part in between, <laughs> uh, it can take hours, right? You can spend a whole night in here. And then, okay, for me, the material used to take forever getting the material just right. And then it was like, no, that one corner is, okay, so I was working on that, okay, or that crease down the middle, right? Um, so that used to take forever. Then I would, the rest of it would go up quick, and then the letters. That was the other thing that would take all the time. Okay, thank you. That's just telling me it's time to do the bulletin board. Um, okay, then you have your letters, which that feels like it takes forever, okay? So anyways, just doing the material this way that I'm gonna show you, if you don't want wrinkles, if you don't want that infamous crease right down the middle of the board. Um, if you don't want your board to be drooping by the middle of the month, which is probably when your advisory teacher is going to grade it, right? Um, and then this is a nice one. If you, if you want to put up your board without begging someone else to come and help you. So I just do it myself. I just made my little way of doing it where it works and someone else isn't there, you know, holding up the material and their arms are falling off and whatever. It works very well. Okay, so. I'll head over there and show you girls how it works. Okay, so this is a big board and it is a lot of material, but if you can do it this way, it works. 
Okay, let me find my corner real quick here. I even labeled it, so I would start with the right corner. Hey, you know, preparing. It's all about preparing, Amanda. Oh, I have no doubt. <laughs> she says, I have no doubt. Here it is. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to explain it a tad bit first before I start putting it up. But, okay, this is how I no I'll normally start. I will start always on the left-hand side. It must be a teacher thing, you know? You read left to right, so everything we do in the classroom is always left to right. That's probably why I do it. But you start up in the left-hand corner, and I just anchor it um, right in the corner with a staple, and then I'll go a little bit out this way so that you don't have this material hanging. You know what I'm saying? Like, the rest of it is just dragging, and it's pulling it all down. So I'll staple out a few. Um, steps across here and then I'll work it all the way down here and then I'll finish going across the top all the way okay till it's at the end um, and then I come back here at the bottom and I start stapling while I'm doing that of course I'm you know pulling it down like this and this part can get a little bit tricky um, if you haven't put it straight up at the top, then this part can be a little uneven. But you know, remember, you do have your border that's going to be covering it, excuse me, covering it. So, okay, then I finish all the way here at the bottom. The last thing is that I'm left here at this side. This is your, your final, you give it a tug and staple it. And then if you need to cut off anything here, that's your time to do it. So at that point, okay, you can see this material, it's been folded. I mean, it's not perfectly, um, it's wrinkled. <laughs> so. But if you do it that way, then at the end, your board material, it'll look fine, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with it. And we should be good. And this now probably takes me the least amount of time of anything else I do on my bulletin board, except when I do it in heels. Okay, so I'm gonna start just giving a good corner here, stapling it and securing it. Oh boy. <laughs> All right, take two, take two. That happens sometimes. Okay. Okay, and then right away, you, you wanna try to grab this piece here so that it's not, you know, the thing that's hanging down for you. It's not wearing on you. Okay, then I'm gonna start working it down on the side. And as I'm doing that, I'm pulling it each time down. Okay. This has been my faithful blue for many moons now. Okay, so about that much, we'll just keep it fine. And then look, you know, you always think you have to have someone to come and hold this, but this works just fine. You're kind of just moving your chair down as you're going. Okay, again, working my way down. I can't believe I have this being recorded. All right. See, I mean, it's for one person doing it. It's going pretty fast. That's hilarious, but there's a cough drop up here. Anyone want a cough drop? <laughs> I did not put that there, I guarantee you. Oh my. <sighs> okay, almost finished with the top part. And then the bottom goes really fast. You'll really be able to pick it up. And then again, if I have extra material that ends up being over here on this side, I'm not worried about it because I can always tuck it in before I put my border up, okay? All right, so I'll start at the bottom now. This should go really fast. And also, I don't normally have too much here that ends up going below the metal rim, but if I did, I would just simply fold it and put it underneath the border. So I'm just giving it a good tug each time.
Oops. Okay, so if you do it like this, girls, you really should have no need of ironing, spraying, nothing. Okay, and then look, I'm on the home stretch. Just start up here. And like I said, this one came out, you can just redo that. And like I said, you're just gonna give it one last tug, and then you're doing these staples in sideways. And this I normally will just kind of fold it over to the side a little bit but if you pull it down then it will be hidden below your border okay look at that all done and it's fast super fast and then you just put your border up the rest of it and you're good to go